Um, well, good evening, everybody out there in internet land. My name is Dr. Ben Bellarado. I'm the lab director here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And I'm really excited to uh, be the moderator for this evening's webinar um, uh, that's entitled Multivocality in Archaeology, the Case Study from the Mimbres Mogion Region with uh, my friend, Dr. Fumi Arakawa. Um, so before we get started, I want to go through a couple introductory slides and just uh, get you acquainted with this webinar series uh, in case you haven't tuned in in the past. And hopefully this will help enhance your, in view your viewing experience. All right, so before we get started, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, or Navajo, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this in institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Now, our mission-related work would not be possible without the indigenous people in the past, the present, and the future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. And Crow Canyon is grateful um, to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. So here at Crow Canyon, our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experimental, or sorry, experiential education, and uh, American Indian knowledge. And you can get more information on our, uh, our work and our mission and, and all the work and research we do um, at crowcanyon.org. Now our 170 acre campus uh, is, is shown right here in this slide. We're uh, right at the head of the Sleeping Ute Mountain in Southwest Colorado, outside of Cortez, Colorado. And um, uh, we have just an incredible campus. We do a lot of really amazing things and we invite you to check out our website, uh, see all the different programs and, and research we're doing and, um, and come visit us as, as soon as our, our campus opens. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about how to use Zoom, I know over the last couple of years, a lot of people have gotten really accustomed to using Zoom, the video conferencing program, but just in case you, you aren't familiar with that, um, I'll give you a couple tips that, that might help you out. So um, uh, you can move the talking head. So at least for, for, my, for me, when I'm starting out uh, up in the upper right, you can see um, a little screen with, with myself, myself talking here, my head, Fumi's t uh, head, and then Taylor Hasbrook, our, our webinar uh, gurus, uh, uh, little box there. And if those are in your way, you can actually click on those and you can change different types of settings. You can also move those boxes around. Um, so in case something gets covered up or, or you want to, um, you know, pay more attention to the slides or look at Fumi a little more closely too. Um, and we ask you and encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A. So down at the, the, the bottom of your screen or somewhere on your screen, you should see this little, this little box that has chat, raise hand, Q&A, and live transcript. And if you want to click on the Q&A, you can type in questions for Dr. Arakawa. And at the end of his presentation, uh, we'll go ahead and try to compile those. And so we can ask him some, some questions from his interesting presentation. Uh, and we ask that you put that in the Q&A and not the chat. Chat is usually kind of reserved for more um, um, you know, uh, personal greetings, such as how you doing, Fumi? Miss you. I haven't seen you for a while. Your baby looks really cute. He's showing us a picture of his baby. Um, and, um, and, and so, yeah, put your questions in the Q&A. If you're having difficulties uh, seeing this presentation, you can head over to our live stream at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook, and you can see almost, um, you know, in time, uh, presentation basically it's like a, I think one or two second lag or something like that but you can see uh, the presentation there and then you can also tune in to um, watch this again later or watch some of our other webinars we've done in the past on our YouTube channel and so that's crowcanyon.org slash YouTube and we invite you to like and subscribe and that once we get enough of those uh, likes and subscribes you can actually unlock other functions that help us to give you an even better webinar experience okay uh, in the next couple of weeks, we have some other interesting presentations. Uh, next week, we have Lauren Aragon, fashion designer and multimedia artist, um, brought to you by Lauren Aragon. And, um, and um, he is a, um, uh, a Pueblo fashion designer that um, actually makes uh, 
clothes and dresses for, for high profile folks uh, using indigenous uh, based designs and such. Um, so that should be really interesting. That's next week on Thursday, April 21st at 4 p.m. And then the following week, we have the sacredness of practicing ancestral Pueblo agriculture and adapting to modern changes by Reina um, Bentea, and she is a traditional Zuni farmer that will be talking about uh, and ancestral Pueblo agricultural techniques. So that's next Thursday, April 28th at 4 p.m. And that also should be really interesting. So please tune in. <clears throat> so now I want to shift uh, to our, our main presentation for this evening. Um, and uh, the the title of this webinar is called Multivocality in Archaeology, the case study from the Mimbres Mogion region with Dr. Fumi Arakawa. And I'll tell you a little bit about my friend Fumi here. I've known for a long time. He actually used to have the position I do now at Crow Canyon, this lab director. And uh, he's gone on to do uh, additional incredible things. Um, so Fumi Arakawa is currently a museum director at the University Museum and a professor of anthropology at the New Mexico, at New Mexico State University or NMSU. Uh, he's also a research associate with Crook Canyon Archaeological Center, of course. Um, and Fumi decided to become a Southwestern archaeologist while par participating in the Crow Canyon internship back in 1998. So we're just about to get a whole new batch of interns here. So just keep that in mind as you come to Crow Canyon for an internship. Eventually, you could you know, become as popular and famous as, as Dr. Fumi Arakawa. Um, and so he obtained his doctoral degree in anthropology from Washington State University. His primary interest is reconstructing socio-political organization among the ancestral Pueblos in uh, the Mesa Verde region, as well as the Gila Forks, which is in Gila Na uh, National Forest. Uh, in that region. He's led several NMSU summer field schools in the Gila National Forest, New Mexico since 2015. And he's conducted community center surveys at Alkali Ridge for several years, as well as uh, he's currently excavating at the coal bed site in southeastern Utah in collaboration with Brigham Young University and Weber State University. Um, and he, uh, since he became the museum director uh, at NMSU in 2015, Fumi has explored topics related to multi multivocal studies in archaeology. And his presentation, or this presentation, will exemplify and showcase one of uh, several multivocal studies in the Mimbres Mogion area. So, <clears throat> Without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn uh, this over to Dr. Fumi Arakawa. And so, Fumi, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right. thank and you. let you go ahead and share yours. So thank you so much thank and, you know and welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for such a wonderful introduction, Ben. I truly appreciate it. All right. Um, OK, can you see? the PowerPoint, all right? I can, I can. Okay. All right, so good evening, everyone. And I'm so happy to share my research today. And the title of my talk is Multivocality in Archaeology, the case study from the members Mogion region. And Dr. Atsunori Ito, uh, he's locating right here. And he's working at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, Japan and I are presenting this paper together today. And Dr. Ito has been working with, you know, those Hopi artists for probably more than 15 or close to 20 years. So that's his background. All right, so before getting to the today's theme or topic, I just wanna give you a you know, brief background of, of um, you know, my background, basically who is Fumi Arakawa. And some people know that I pretty much grew up in Japan um, in a city called Komaki City near Nagoya, Japan. And I grew up there until I was 19 years old and came to US and then start studying anthropology and archeology. span Oops. And when I was, uh, you know, I was at the Washington State University, I pretty much trained as a processual archeologist. That means that, you know, I learned how to kind of reconstruct and understand archaeological records by looking at scientific and positive, positivistic approach or perspectives. So basically using the you know, scientific studies to see how those people lived in the past. 
but this perspective or approach has changed uh, since you know I became a museum director at the New Mexico State that took place in 2015. And what happened was that you know I kind of got very interested in the relationship between artifacts, also a landscape, and the Native Americans' perspectives. And actually, when I was undergraduate students, you know, that was I was very, very interested in, in uh, how Native Americans see those artifacts and you know the uh, landscapes in uh, you know mostly like uh, you know uh, Idaho, Washington, and some portion of Colorado. And then after I became a museum director, I have been kind of trying to integrate the Native Americans voices and narratives using a East Asian organic view of the world. It sounds pretty fancy, but what this Eastern Asian organic view of the world means that, you know, a lot of East Asian people believes that everything is somehow connected. You know, everything is connected with something else. So even, you know, two different, totally opposite or totally different things, you know, those two things can be connected or have some kind of relationship. So that perspective or, you know, the framework I have been using that. And then the one very big framework is called correlative or correlative thinking. And I use that, this kind of East Asian perspective to kind of figure out how, you know, North American archeologists can integrate, you know, Native Americans voices and narratives and then how you know your American scientists or archaeologists can integrate you know their voices and the narratives. So the, today's presentation is a, just a one portion of the, this kind of overarching big theoretical framework of correlative archaeology or thinking. And this presentation actually is covered in a chapter five in a new book or forthcoming book, and. Yeah, just uh, try to give you a, you know, advertisement or announcement. So this forthcoming book is actually will be published in June, I think, this year. So if you are more interested in, you know, how I use the Eastern Asian perspectives to archaeological records, yeah, please, please read this book. And also, if you want to get into more, you know, get more interested in the today's topic you can read in a chapter five of this book as well. So before getting into the, my you know, major theme, I just wanna go through some important aspect regarding members' pottery. You know, members' pottery are culturally sensitive object. And why is that? Because you know, those members' pottery uh, pretty much, you know, use those people by the mortuary practice or ritual purposes. And those objects can be imbued with anima or spirits and generally associated with burial. So that's why, you know, the members pottery can be a very, very culturally sensitive objects. So because of this, you know, very culturally sensitive object, uh, while we carry out the review sessions with Hopi artists, we attempted to avoid members' pottery bowls with a kill hole. And the kill hole uh, is a, it is an intentional puncture at the base of the bowl, which appears to be associated with the ceremonial function. So whenever we see the evidence of kill hole, then we didn't review those, you know, we didn't touch or we didn't actually, um, yeah, um, didn't touch those objects. Instead, we use a you know, monitor to show those kill holes, only a few pieces. And then also uh, to respect culturally sensitive object, I will show a few members pottery vessels which came from a non-burial context. Or if members pottery vessels do not have provenience information, I will display drawing on them in this presentation. So then what I'm gonna talk about is those three big points. Since I don't have much time, I'm gonna just you know, get into those three major points. Why is the members culture? What is members? And what kind of things we know about the members culture? 
And then second theme would be the singular case study of the members pottery workshop. Uh, this is a uh, you know, collaboration between archeologists, anthropologists and descendant groups, especially Hopi artists. And then finally, I just wanna go through my reflections and accomplishments from this particular case study. So just keeping in mind those three big ideas throughout this presentation. So now I'd like to briefly talk about why I became interested in carrying out the members pottery workshop with Hopi artists. The one major reason is that the Fred Capote, a Hopi artist and a prominent Native American scholar published an incredible book uh, regarding his own interpretations of members pottery designs in 1940s. And Dr. Ito, is also interested in his contributions of the Hopi jewelries. So Dr. Ito is very interested in the contemporary Hopi jewelries, how those designs and motifs are depicted and where those designs ideas actually came from. So his book title is Design from Ancient Membranos with the Hopi Interpretations by Fred Capote in 1949. And this is a rare book, which was written by a Native American artist regarding members pottery. And Dr. Ito and my research interests became intersected because of Fred Capote's previous work. And I got interested in uh, members designs because of, you know, just a one quote from Fred Capote. So in his word, once he said, quote, while archaeologists and other students are working on the outlines of its history, making it clearer year by year, they cannot completely appreciate the feelings and responses which come from instinctively from one who has lived in that culture. And this quote inspired me and I thought that I should explore the potential meanings of members' pottery by listening to contemporary Hopi artist narratives about you know, prehistoric materials. And just importantly, just keep in mind that this members pottery workshop as a one portion of a one part of much bigger project and which is called the Info Forum Museum Project. And this project has been conducted by many, many cultural anthropologists, uh, folklorists and cultural anthropologists, as I said, the museum personnel at the Minpaku, the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, Japan. So what is this, you know, Info Forum Museum project? I'm gonna just quote one quotation from the Kishigami. He's a, one of the Minpaku researcher. So Kishigami said, quote, the ultimate objective of our Info Forum project is to contribute to the creative transmission of local cultures and to academic progress by developing accessible information databases using Minpaku's collections of cultural objects and visual audio materials and collaborative research and information sharing with source communities. That means where collections were previously made and academic circles and other groups. So just want to briefly talk about, you know, Dr. Ito's accomplishment. As I said, he has been working on this project, you know, for many, many years. And as of April 2018, he has visited three countries and he also visited 14 different museums and 22 Hopi reviewers or other Native American reviewers look at those objects. And those reviewers look at more than 2000 pieces of you know, uh, contemporary and prehistoric items. And Dr. Ito also spent more than 38,000 minutes of movies because one of his method is that whenever he reviewed those objects, he recorded and then he tried to transcribe all recorded materials and then also deal with cultural sensitive materials with those reviewers. So that's why he has been spending so many minutes of dealing with those movies or films. So today, what I wanna do is we're gonna take a look at two museums. One is NMSU Museum 
uh, located in Las Cruces, New, Me New Mexico. And we look at 15 items at the museum. And then we also look at 22, you know, members pottery curated at the Geronimo Springs Museum in TUSC or Truth or Consequences. So we're gonna just take a look at those two museums instead of, you know, those many different museums showing here. So as I said, the Info Forum Museum project is not only dealing with Southwest, you know, uh, US, but a lot of cultural anthropologists working at the Minpaku, you know, studying about many different countries, including Korea, Japan, Oceania, US Southwest, that's pretty much done by Dr. Ito, and Arctic, Taiwan, Ainu, Africa, Southeast Asia. So as I said, the Members Pottery Workshop is a just one portion of this, you know, much bigger uh, project called Info Forum Museum Project. And if you can read those words, you are super. Um, those, you know, three lines indicate where Dr. Ito got funding from, and those are equivalent of NSF in the U.S. So he got a lot of money for this project. And I got the internal grant from, for the exhibition outreach from New Mexico State. So now just um, get into the members. You know, I hope I can talk about 40 minutes about members' cultures, but I cannot do that. So I'm gonna just give you a three points or four points. The why is the members' culture is a part of Mogion cultural area, right? Locating in the Southwest portion of New Mexico and Southeast portion of Arizona and some portions of Northern uh, Mexico. And uh, members culture flourished from about 81,000 to 1130 or 1150, depending on where you work. And at the time around 81,000, the members people start building or constructing the above ground Pueblo structures and start using plaza instead of the great kibas. But the most well known for members is, as you know, members pottery, right? Uh, members who are classic members pottery he has very unique, dynamic, and spectacular designs, including the anthropomorphic designs or zoomorphic designs with uh, very, you know, elaborated uh, geometric designs on it as well. So I was lucky to actually got into the members culture because I could start working, you know, in a, what we call Hira Folks region. And this study area includes the Hira cliff dwellings. If you know, you, or you have been there, you know, nice cliff dwellings there. So that Hira Folks region include the Hira cliff dwellings as well. And in this map showing those black dots, indicating the relatively large community centers within this region. And NMSU has been conducting that, you know, field schools at the Twin Pines Village and South Diamond Creek Pueblo since 2015. And as I said, we have been working at the two different sites, one is Twin Pines Pueblo. We worked in 2015 and we worked three weeks in 2021. And then we also worked in uh, one small site called South Diamond Creek Pueblo, and we could conduct the recovery excavation. That means that this site as showing right here is a very small four room members, you know, classical members component site. And this site has been eroded heavily. And when we went there, probably one side of the wall on the northern portion of the site has been, you know, eroded. So the Hira National Forest Archaeology thought that you know, we needed to do a recovery excavation and then record you know, information as much as we could. So we spent there at the South Diamond Creek um, in 2016, 2017, and 2019. And those are the people who worked at the Twin Pines and South Diamond Creek Pueblo. So now getting to the main topic about pottery, right? As some of you know me pretty well. You might say that why Fumi is not talking about lithics because for my thesis and dissertation, I pretty much focus on the lithics. But you know, since I worked, start working at the 
uh, member sites, my focus kind of switched and I became more interested in uh, pottery. So I have a one simple question for you, or maybe for us, you know, what do we, we means archeologists do after finding a pottery vessel like this? So this is a armor plane, uh, you know, vessel discovered or recovered from the South Diamond Creek Pueblo, right? So what do we do, the archeologists do? And typically I borrow this kind of, you know, the pottery coding sheets from Crow Canyon and I imitated and made or modified to um, members pottery coding sheets. So whenever we find the complete pottery vessel like that, you know, archeologists usually try to classify them into like a vessel form. Is that pottery like a jar or a bowl or a ladle or a seizure or other forms? And then we also look at, you know, pottery, like a complete pottery or a broken shards, like a finishing type. If, you know, pottery is painted, then we're gonna ask like, is this a carbon paint or a mineral paint or a mixture? Or, you know, do we see evidence of smudging on the interior or exterior design or exterior surface of the pottery? And then we also look at vessel part. You know, if we have a broken shard, then we say it is a rim shirt or a body or a handle or a bottom part. And then after that, we usually classify the pottery into a wares. It is a corrugated wear, plain wear, or a, you know, painted wares or non-local wares or red wear. And then after that, we classify those pottery into types, right? It is a member's classic type or later style, or it is a armor neck banded or it is a corrugated wear and that small pottery jar you saw in the previous slide that can be defined as armor plane dating from 8250 to 1300. So that's what we usually do, right? So when we you know, just started the members pottery workshop, Dr. Ito and I checked the archives or our you know, library or museum curated areas and we look at one particular pottery right here. And this pottery like uh, showing uh, crane-like designs inside the bowl is actually came from a uh, floor context. It was not from a uh, you know, mortuary practice or a burial context. This was from a floor. And then we look at you know, what kind of descriptions or interpretations of this pottery were recorded by archeologists as well as museum personnel. So this is what we found. It was only two page summaries of this particular member's pottery. So archeologists and you know, museum personnel classify this pottery into like a ceramic type. It is a member's classic black and white and ceramic wares. It is a brown wear and ceramic cities. It's a member's cities and ceramic form. This is a bowl. And then they also recorded that this particular pottery was curated at the museum in 1980, even though this was excavated in the 1970s. So we could find only two page summary of this particular wonderful pottery vessels at the museum. So under these circumstances, you know, Dr. Ito and I created the seven objective of the members pottery workshop. And I'm gonna just go through those seven points. The first is to share information of archeological collections to the descendant groups. And second, to respect and take care of cultural sensitivity. You know, what kind of information we can share, what we can publish, and then the public can actually see and then read those materials. And third is to record the Hopi reviewers narratives. And we thought that we can do better documentation of the, those pottery or members pottery. And fourth is to reanimate archeological collections under the InfoForum Museum database. So what is reanimating means? Uh, reanimating means the combining virtual objects, documents and interviews online. So basically put everything together online settings and people can see those. And number six is to exhibit the result of the members pottery workshop. 
And then number seven is to conduct the outreach program with NMSU students, as well as the Las Cruces communities. So those are the seven objectives we had before we carried out the members' party workshop. So now I'd like to switch gears and focus on the members' party workshop using multivocal approach. So in a few slides, um, you know, in a few next couple slides, I'm gonna talk about those three points. One is what is multivocality and how we conducted collaborative work with Hopi descendant community and what kind of methods we use and how we analyze the Hopi artist narratives. So just try to define, you know, what is the multivocal approach? So since I don't have time, I'm gonna just use two quotes from the prominent cultural anthropologist and archeologist. One is defined by Chip Cowell. And once he said that quote, ideally the goal of multivocal text is not to create a unified narrative, but to bring together the multiple perspectives to expose how each voice bears and bails different truths. And Ian Harder, who is a prominent you know, post-processual archeologist once said, the archeologists have a responsibility to include interpretations of diverse individuals and groups. And this not only makes archeology span relevant to them, but it also improves interpretation of that past. And I have been saying the descendant or source communities, and I just wanna define it, the descendant communities means that people who are descendant of ancient groups and those that have a cultural affiliation. And importantly, to enhance that multivocal approach in archaeology, we insist in that archaeologists have to develop a mutually beneficial relationship with descendant community members. And this concept was introduced by Jim Enope. He's a Zuni elders and he's a scholars and others, including the Cynthia Chavez Lammers, Chip Cowell, Kerry Hayes Gilpin, Atsunori Ito, and others actually talked a lot about how can we actually, uh, you know, we means the archeologists can carry out mutually beneficial relationship with the descendant groups. So in our members workshop, we stress three important aspects regarding the development of mutually beneficial relationship. This research first, uh, this research helps Native American artists inspire to innovate and create new artistic designs and object. And it is important to note that the, you know, approximately 70% or 80% of Hopi people are artists. They are so talented. I always envy how come those people can make such a beautiful objects. So that's we believe is that reconnecting contemporary Hopi artists to ancient object will prompt them to innovate and create something new for their own artistries. And second, this research allows Native American artists to record and preserve their voices for future generations. In other words, the Hopi reviewers have expressed an interest in recording their voices for future generation. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna rephrase that. So in other words, the Hopi reviewers have expressed an interest in recording their voices to preserve their oral histories for their descendant populations. So in other words, you know, their grandkids, grand grandkids, or children can listen to how their grandfather or grandmother described and interpreted those objects in the past. And then they can learn from it and then they can actually reconnect the artifacts or uh, object, you know, with them. So third, this research allows both museum personnel and descendant community members to access and see virtual object documents and interviews online. And we call it a reanimate museum collection. So descendant community members do not have to come to Minpaku or other museum to see a particular object. Rather, they can virtually see it using an online museum website. 
So in turn, the full museum personnel and archaeologists, we can develop and preserve crucial documents and information in our database. And we may obtain more information regarding museum collections from descendant committee members who look at the reanimated objects online. So now just quickly take a look at you know, methods, what kind of methods we use. And there are six different methods that we went through. The one is artists reviewed or viewed and discussed the 37 members vessels. And those artists also visited the members area. And the Ito analyzed the Hopi artist narratives and Hopi artists and Ito stored in InfoForum Museum database at the Minpaku. And Hopi artists produced new objects. And Ito, Hopi artists, and I conducted an uh, exhibition at the American Indian Student Center at the New Mexico State. And finally, the Hopi artists and I conducted the outreach programs in Las Cruces. So that's a pretty much methods. I know it's an you know, not scientific methods, but those are the things we did throughout this project. And the uh, different colors highlight who carried out each step described in the next few slides. So we look at 15, you know, pottery vessels curated at the New Mexico State University. And those Hopi reviewers or Hopi people uh, reviewed not only members pottery, but they also look at corrugated pottery and also one Alma Plain and another San Francisco Red Ball uh, created at the you know, University Museum at the New Mexico State. And we also visited the Geronimo Springs Museum in Truth of Consequences. And you know, we did that because the University Museum did not have many figurative or anthropomorphic or zoomorphic designs of members' balls. So we went to Geronimo Springs to look at 22 members' pottery there. Okay, so those are the five Hopi artists participating in this members' pottery workshop. The Gwen Satara, she's a contemporary Hopi potter. And Spencer Nutaima, he's a Kachina doll carver. And Gerald Lamabentima, he's a contemporary Hopi silversmith. And he also teach you know, young Hopi people to learn how to make traditional Hopi silversmiths in Hopi as well. And Ramson Lamatewaima, he's a contemporary blow glass or a glass blower. And finally, Ed Capote, he's a grandson of Fred Capote. And he's a painter, potter, and songwriter. And he you know, always plays a nice music as well. So those are the five Hopi artists participating in that uh, workshop. And just give you a distance from members to Hopi. If you can read those words, you are super. Those are written in Japanese. But anyway, from members to Hopi, it's about 300 miles. That means about 480 kilometers, if you know metrics better. So in addition to that pottery review, we believe that the landscape at the center of this study allows the artists to experience the same landscapes as their ancestor groups. By visiting the landscape, the Hopi artists engage their four senses, seeing, touching, hearing, and feeling, facilitating their experience. And this experience allows them to delve into the landscape and presumably you know, connect their senses with members' partners' perspectives and authentics. Therefore, the Hopi artists and the PIs based in the heartland of members' river valley and upper river, upper Hira areas in members' regions for two days. And this is another photo uh, close to the Hira Creek dwellings, where there is a big members' component site called TJ Ruin. And the creek or river you see is a uh, West Fork. And it's a, such a beautiful area if you haven't been there yet. So now I just want to show you how the review session took place. And I'm going to just show uh, one example done by Ramson, you know, how he reviewed one pottery. 
So then you get the basic ideas how this review session took place for. This is interesting to me because it does have two fish instead of just one in it. Um, I haven't seen this before, but I'm sure there are probably more pots out there that also have two fish or maybe even more than that. Uh, I, I was real, I'm really intrigued by uh, Gwen's idea of maybe these being hallmarks of sorts for different potters and uh, you know, to me, uh, things like that are, are worth looking into, you know, maybe, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but, you know, just to at least pursue that question, I think is really important, you know, just maybe someone could do a dissertation on just the rings and nothing else, but that I, when, when she mentioned that, I would, it, that really just you know, got me to think about the way we identify our own pieces. You know, today it's primarily our initials or our clan symbols, uh, but uh, maybe the people who made these pots, uh, maybe this was their way of um, kind of signing their pieces, you might say. Uh, and um, the other thing that I, that got me to thinking that was Gerald's uh, question about the use of these pots, you know, because we do use baskets and pottery as uh, exchanges during weddings. You know, today we use quilts for naming ceremonies. And uh, did they have that same practice, you know, were these gift exchanges? Maybe, uh, maybe somebody smartly brought this bowl over. Uh, with food in it, you know, and but we don't know about the social structure back then. There's really no, no evidence of marriage or anything like that to help us to answer that. So these are just uh, things that we ask without really. Maybe we shouldn't expect to find an answer, but they're they're still interesting questions. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I was looking at this. Um, you know, it's, it's not the cleanest, um, bowl in terms of the line definitions or the, the steadiness of the line. Uh, but it, it was interesting, this one in particular to me, because I tended to see on the upper part of the bodies, the, you know, the, the parallel lines and then a wide, um, uh, space and then more parallel lines and what that made me think of is if i look at a fish in a pond uh, you see the the reflections of the ripples of the water on the backs of the fish and then underneath it's in the shadow so it appears darker where you can actually see the scales uh, so that was something that i just was looking at you know um, it's really interesting to incorporate lines and checkerboards uh, in there, uh, which I don't think the other uh, depictions of fish had. They were pretty much all more simple and not as, not as elaborate as this one. So I thought this one was a pretty interesting piece of pottery just based on the way it was painted and the different um, segments of the checkerboard and the parallel lines. And uh, what I didn't also notice is there seems to be a, a purposeful division between the head and the gills and the rest of the body. I think all of them had some kind of a separation between uh, the head and the rest of the body of the fish. So those are just my questions. So now you got kind of, you know, big ideas how that review session took place. And then after that, we analyze the Hopi artist narratives. And I just gonna talk about four points. One is agreements and disagreements on the particular design. And then I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. The myths and the folklores. Some Hopi artists shared particular animals such as crane, 
hummingbird, and coyote based on their own stories, myths, and folklores. And in terms of the authentics, some Hopi artists became interested in symmetrical versus asymmetrical designs on members' pottery. And in terms of the application to their art, all Hopi artists agree that many of the members' designs and motifs would be able to use for their art. So that was, you know, they said this was a very, you know, in, in, important or interesting projects. So just want to take a look at agreements or disagreements. Um, just want to, you know, take a look at some points. So although each artist constructed their own interpretation of members' pottery designs, the overall interpretation of what is depicted on each member's design was similar. In particular, there was a consensus with the pottery designs related to crane, ram, turkey, and fish. So whenever they see those animals on the members' pottery, they, you know, all Hopi artists agreed on what they are. And some of the abstract designs, such as coyote, honey toad, crane, uh, sorry, so honey toad, kachina figure, and bee, he had multiple interpretations. In addition, some Hopi artists stating that many members' designs, including those representing quail, crane, and turkey, are uh, indeed affiliated with the existence or extinctions of the Hopi clan. And they also interpreted the figurative designs on the honeytad, fish, and crane to symbolize water or moisture. So seeing this crane-like figure you know, it's this design is strongly tied with water or moisture. And in addition to figurative designs inside the members' bowls, all Hopi artists were incredibly thoughtful and sensitive about interior band designs. And some Hopi artists discussed why the number of framing lines are so diverse and what these lines may represent, as Ramson mentioned about in the film. And there are multifaceted interpretation of these framing lines. For example, some interpretations related to the notion that these express the maker's identity. Other thoughts that these symbolize cardinal directions, such as north, south, east, west, and nadir and zenith. And Hopi artists also reviewed a total of 16 members black and white geometric designed pottery. And one major difference between their interpretations of geometric designs versus figurative design ball is that they provided vastly different interpretation of these geometric designs. Among the 16 geometric designs, the Hopi artists were remarkably sensitive and mindful about certain motifs and symbols, including interlocking and intertwining designs and step and cloud designs. So for example, the step and cloud designs represent water or moisture. And certainly there are many boats that depict clouds or step designs. And we believe that members people actively thought about water and reflect, reflected these thoughts and feelings about water into their pottery designs. And the Hopi artists also inform us that, you know, these designs are continue to be drawn by contemporary Hopi artists as we know. So after the review session and visiting the sites is over, the Dr. Ito and some Hopi artists, this, you know, photo show, Ed Capodi, going through the collaborative editing. That means to, uh, try to deal with the culturally sensitive materials. So as I said, Dr. Ito record all documents and then he transcribe those materials or documents. And then he just makes sure that what kind of information, you know, he or we can publish or share and what kind of information we should know. And after that, you know, uh, collaborative editing that Dr. Ito and Hopi artists, you know, creating that or stored those documents and everything into an info forum museum database at the Minpaku. And Minpaku is a national museum of ethnology in Japan. 
And this is an old photo um, of like a kachina doll. And then this would be a member's pottery instead of a kachina doll. But I just wanna indicate a few points. So how this website is organized is that if you click on one individual here, then you can hear his interpretation and descriptions of this particular object, right? And then if you go to your right side, and then Dr. Ito was very innovative and he made the photos, you know, like 360 photography. That means you can see this object from top to bottom and also side to side. And to achieve our goal of displaying the result of our project, so we plan to do an exhibition at the end. So Ito Sensei conducted another workshop at the Museum of Northern Arizona in October 2017. And several Hopi artists, including three Hopi artists who participated in our workshop, or, sorry, the workshop and seven, seven silversmith students of Gerald participated in these projects. And what they did was the Hopi artists selected their favorite members' designs, then they draw and cut these designs using paper as showing right there. So since I don't have much time, I'm gonna just go through it. Um, so on the left, you see what kind of pottery that each Hopi artist got inspired. And then on the right, the contemporary object shows how the end product looks like. So Ramson was inspired by these two fish designs on the member's ball. And then he created such a wonderful kachina maiden glass item. And then fish is depicted on the bottom of this kachina maiden glass item. And Gerald got inspired by these wonderful uh, crane-like figures. And then he made the wonderful, you know, bow tie uh, material uh, product. And he's gonna just briefly explain, you know, how he made this and then explain what he thought about this object. Hello, my name is Loma Ventima. My first name is Gerald. My other name is Loma Ventima. This here is a bow tie of the technique of uh, the silver system done in the 1930s. Silver, members inspired design for water birds in a way which is called a bit of it. So the stone is also natural from Bisbee, Arizona, uh, which is rare. And uh, I believe that the members and the Hopi have a connection just by looking at the design on the pottery. closeness between so very inspiring to see the designs of the pottery in Nigeria. And Gwen got inspired by this kind of hummingbird design and then she made the contemporary Hopi pottery. And she also inspired by many different designs as well. And she created such a spectacular you know, jars and sieb jar based on those members' designs showing right here. And Ed got inspired by this coyote-like figure. And then he drew this wonderful, you know, uh, like a look like an American flag. But actually Ed used this drawing to express his narratives about the Pueblo revolt. And if you are interested in his story, he talked a lot about these designs in another YouTube. You can find you know, what these designs actually means, like why there are seven lines on the back and what those seven lines indicate. And Spencer got inspired by this kind of Kachina figure you know, uh, drawing, and he made that wonderful Kachina doll. And then he also put the big pottery on the back. And this is a pretty, actually a pretty big piece that, you know, it was a just wonderful, wonderful item. So I hope to show Gwen's kind of, you know, impressions on the members pottery workshop, but I only have like a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna skip it. If Gwen's watching this, I'm sorry.
So after everything is done, reviewing process, visiting the sites, and then we did the exhibition at the American Indian Student Center. And I can probably talk, you know, 20, 30 minutes why we didn't do the exhibition at the University Museum. Instead, we did it at the American Indian Student Center. But basically, you know, when we got into the museum, we still had the Nagpura related materials, those are human remains and the funeral object. And some of the Hopi artists thought that they just do not want to put their contemporary art close to human remains and the funeral objects. So therefore, we decided to use American Indian Student Center instead of a university museum. But anyway, so what you see here is this is our major exhibitions, uh, you know, there, and it's uh, a little bit small, but I really enjoy doing this. And what we emphasize was that not the members' pottery itself, but we emphasize the their inspired objects, such as, you know, the Spencer's Kachina doll and Ed's drawings and Ramson's nice, you know, the glow, uh, blow glass item, and then also Gwen's wonderful contemporary Hopi pottery. So that was, uh, you know, small, and then it was a little bit different from how people usually do for a member's exhibition, because they usually put a lot of member's pottery and then show them, but we didn't do that. And then we also put some photos on the windows and it's a very beautiful areas. And then, yeah, it was a wonderful exhibition we could do. And then we did the Dawson tour and then we also did the panel discussion. And then this is another story I can talk about, but what happened was just before our exhibition opened, there was a one incident took place at the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, another museum tried to do a member's pottery workshop, not a workshop, a member's pottery exhibition there in Chicago, but that exhibition got canceled because they did not consult with tribal groups. You know, those people just tried to put the member's pottery on the exhibitions and then just try to display it, but they didn't consult or talk to native groups. So that exhibition got canceled. So in this panel discussions, we talked about how our exhibition is or was different. And then those you know, five Hopi artists participated in it and they supported this exhibition. And then we didn't have to cancel it like the how Art Institute of Chicago did. And after the exhibition, I invited three Hopi artists. Unfortunately, the two could not make it, but three Hopi artists came back after four or five months later and did a demonstration of their you know, um, art or artistry. So Gwen, uh, Gerald and Ramson came to, you know, the class or class settings and give a lectures. And Gwen talked about the, you know, traditional Hopi pottery and her genealogical lines of pottery making. And Gerald talked about the history of Hopi silversmiths. And Ramson talked about like art, you know, the difference between art in West and Native Americans. And those lectures are just wonderful. And all students learned so much from them. And then they also did the demonstrations. Uh, Gwen came to a class and then taught students how to make the traditional Hopi pottery. And Gerald did the trans, uh, demonstration of tufa casting. And then Ramson carried his trader and did the demonstration of blow glass you know, manufacturing processes. And then the next day on Saturday in Las Cruces, we have a farmer's bar market year round. So we put the four tables and then those three Hopi artists did a show and tell and talked a lot about the Hopi art. And that was a very productive uh, event as well. So now, since I don't have time, I just wanna go through the, my reflections. Uh, what I learned or what I got from this uh, experience. So in my attempt to be an independent observer, I came to notice several aspects of this type of collaborative work. And I will address several issues related to collaborative efforts between academic institutions and Native Americans. The first, all of Hopi artists stating that their review of the members' vessels would inform their own artistic designs and techniques. 
And this project provides memories and feelings they will take into the future. For example, several of the Hopi artists compared symmetrical versus asymmetrical na nature of painting designs inside members both with their own artistic style and authentics. And this gives them the opportunity to incorporate new designs and motifs in their own contemporary art. And second, by investigating members' painting designs and Hopi artists hoped to reconnect the ancestral or ancient or members' partners' perspectives with their own. So some Hopi artists taking part in this project give attention to members' people's hunting, agricultural practice, family, and crown system and exchange with other groups in the region in around 11th or early 12th century. And third, it was important to highlight that each Hopi artist offers a different belief, perspective, and practice regarding sacred ancestral object. For example, a ceramic bowl with a hole on the bottom is generally associated with their burial practice indicating that the you know, pottery bowl was a very important and sacred object. So when we encounter, we encounter a member's bowl with a kill hole, one participant was able to touch and feed it, but another was not. So it is important for archeologists to not generalize about the cultural taboos based on one clan member's interpretations, rather, Archaeologists ought to obtain multifaceted interpretations from clan members across a wide demography. And this is especially true regarding ritual knowledge that has been instilled in different clan members, as not all clan members share the same knowledge. And finally, each Hopi artist was honestly aware that their interpretations of members' pottery designs were you know, still subjective and do not represent Hopi voices as a whole. So to summarize, you know, to uh, conceptualize what I have been talking about, the multivocal or multi-perspectives, as I said, when or well, usually archaeologists look at the pottery vessels like that, then we try to classify and we are always interested in trying to figure out time and space. And then we also feel that the pottery or those object, ancient object is made by somebody else, right? And then those summaries can be only one, two pages long. It's a, such a small, brief summary. But when or if we conduct multivocal approach, then what we can gain is that we can gain, you know, information about clanship, mass folklores, art authentics, and most importantly, those descendant groups can reconnect those objects with their ancestors. And then those reports can be more than five or 10 pages long, and then we can actually get more, you know, information by conducting multivocal approach. So just accomplishment, I think that all of our objectives are pretty much accomplished and we are so happy about that. But I just wanna you know, point out some points and the contribution to archeology. span And we believe that this project was or a workshop was good because we could document the rich and detailed narratives for each member's pottery by Hopis. And we could also reconnect museum collections, artifacts with the Hopi reviewers. And we could also curate the Hopi reviewers' narratives to the InfoForum Museum database system. And then we could also demonstrate that positive collaborative work by exhibition and also outreach programs. So to conceptualize the multivocality, what I'm saying throughout this presentation is that you know, archaeologists, we are so good at you know, looking at the object by scientific and objective way. But if we can add the descendant voices or their you know, Hopi reviewers narratives and integrating humanistic and multivocal perspectives, then our archeological interpretations can be more rich and dynamics. And then I believe that this is a crucial aspect to approach for archeologists. Yeah. 
And, and finally, I thought this would be a good quote to finish my presentation. And I was reading this Archaeology Southwest magazine in my bathroom a couple of days ago in the morning. And I thought, wow, yeah, this quote would be, you know, fit with what we accomplished from the uh, Members Pottery Workshop. So the Stuart Koyon uh, Yunpitwa, the program manager at the Hopi Cultural Reservation Office, once said or wrote or, you know, was quoted in this volume saying that when you study archaeology, it is not just about science, it's about art. Yet when archaeologists write reports, it's all about science. I think it should be more art, more about art. And archaeologists needed to collaborate with Hopis and other Pueblo communities to engage with what they're witnessing and studying. Furthermore, archaeological reports are written only from archaeological perspectives, and that can affect federal decision making in damaging ways. The overall message is that archaeologists and other researchers should communicate a lot more with Hopi and other Pueblo communities. This is not just about you know, hypothesis and other things. So I thought that this you know, Members Pottery Workshop um, would demonstrate what Stuart said about uh, ideal collaborative work is and focusing on art instead of science. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Ito, Atsunori Ito, and Ramson, Gerald, Ed, Spencer, Gwen, particularly. And then I just want to say thank you to Spencer Nutaima. He actually passed away in 2018. Thank you, Spencer. So that's pretty much it. Sorry, it passed 5.05. .05 and I told Benda, please short his presentations, like five minutes, but he went 10 minutes. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> Throw me under the bus there, Fumi. No, I know, okay. I blame all you, I blame all you. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, here, why don't you stop sharing your screen for a sec? All right. And then um, we can always put you back on if people have uh, questions about specific yeah. um, things. Let's see, my, my there we go. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Fumi. That was really, really interesting. A uh, really, really cool presentation and wow, just so dynamic. Um, wow. <laughs> I had no idea. You need to tell us all about more of this more often. Um, but yeah, so we had a few questions and um, let's see here. Um, several of them come from John Cater. Um, and he wanted to know, first of all, just to get to the front of your presentation, uh, when is your book going to be available? In June. In wow. June. Yeah, I know. It's a, I don't want to say crazy, but it's a, yeah, it's a crazy book. Which I mean, in, you, Fumi, you, in Fumi speak means it's amazing. Um, no, just it's so a, you all know. Yeah. Of uh, having yeah. known Fumi for a long time. Yeah. Do, do um, you remember that? I, I gave a talk for the uh, Archaeology Southwest in 2018. Right. And you invited Dr. Inomata. Yeah, your hero. No, yeah, I was so nervous and I didn't do well at all. But <laughs> after that, right. you know, after that, I thought about the subject or topic and then I put everything together. So that was a good, yeah, I, I think this book is a kind of interesting book. Oh, so you're saying it's my fault that you put this amazing book together. I understand. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, you help me. No. <laughs> no, I can't wait to see it, Fumi. That's really exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's some some other questions and 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 we'll try to uh, to get to as many as we can. Um, so yeah, so were there other tribal voices or tribal groups who are interested in being involved with your study? Um, so, and yeah. then um, mm -hmm. You know, are you going to expand this more um, in the future, or just can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So, as I said, the you know, Dr. Ito has been working with those Hopi artists for more than 15, 20 years. So that's why we worked with Hopi, and then he, you know, he has been very interested in uh, the history of Hopi jewelries, and then he has been closely working with Gerald. So that connections actually, you know, help us actually conduct this workshop. And 
Yeah, we hope, well, I hope that, you know, working with other groups and then do a similar workshop and then see how they're gonna review or interpret those members' pottery would be wonderful. And we can get more information and more, you know, rich text from those, you know, native artists and scholars. Wow, no, that's, that's, that sounds really exciting. Um, so another question is, you know, um, this exhibit that you showed, is it, is it still up and can people uh, go see that? No, it's, it's gone. And we did that exhibition from 2017, no, 2018 through 2019. And then before the COVID, the uh, Amarand, you know, Eric was interested in, you know, borrowing or renting the exhibit. But since he became a director and then so many things happened and I'm not sure, you know, the, um, the loan or, uh, you know, exhibit, how to call it, like a long exhibit might take place or no, I'm not sure. But the exhibit was supposed to be, you know, exhibited at the Amarand, but that has not been taking place yet. Mm. Well, well, let us know um, uh, what what fate has in store for it, or if you're going to develop more yeah. of that. Which is, uh, yeah. several people were very interested in, in checking that out. Um, so we had just a comment from Dr. Susan Ryan, our friend, okay. um, and she says, "Not a question, but I want to thank Drs. Uh, Arakawa and Ito for providing excellent collaboration." based research and for providing a multivocal interpretations of ancestral pottery designs. She says, we need more of this type of research in public education. So um, it's a great you. job. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. So how did um, you and the others involved in the project initiate the cross community um, and uh, disciplinary relations? Was it, was it difficult? Were there any specific aspects that uh, stick in your mind in terms of the, how that process? So, as I said, I kind of got into it because Dr. Ito has been doing this for a long time. And, you know, he already established a good collaborative relationship with those Hopi artists. And so I just got into it. But then, you know, uh, meanwhile, what I actually, you know, before I got into this workshop or this kind of, you know, collaborative or multivocal research, there are a lot of dialogue and discussions took place among native artists and native scholars. For example, Jim and Note, mm -hmm. you know, um, that used to be a, a museum director at the Zuni, and he had the visions where he had the great ideas and then he and others, including, you know, uh, the Cynthia Chavez Lamar and other native, you know, artists and scholars pretty much, you know, worked at the SAR and then created the how we can actually do a collaborative work. And then also how can we actually, you know, reach that good balance between academics and Native Americans and how can we do a mutually beneficial research? So I'm just, you know, kind of following what those people suggested for us to do. And that, that, that you know, following that, I think just uh, following that kind of uh, information and the knowledge and then, you know, start working with those Hopi and I have been also working with Zuni elders as well. Then, you know, we, kind of create or developing a good mutually beneficial relationship. So first it was hard to get in and just be honest, I got uh, you know lectures for many, many hours from Jim <laughs> because what or how I contacted or you know created the uh, relationship was not right. So I, I learned from Jim and other people and you know, once I kind of figure out how, you know, what kind of uh, collaborative work we should do, and then I got kind of get into it. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, Jim's a, a great guy. I've, I've had the opportunity yeah. to talk to him only once so far, but um, yeah, yeah, uh, he, he yeah, has a his vision, and he has uh, excellent, you know, visions, and always create the, you know, movement that people actually start doing things. So right. he's my yeah excellent mentor. 
Nice. Um, there was a question just about Ed Cabote. Um, is he also a member of Santa Clara Pueblo, or is he? Yeah, yeah he's a uh, he's a uh, you know from a uh, Santa Clara and then also Hopi. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Um, let's see here. Um, is there any? So what is the venue or is there a venue right now where where people can access um, your projects, you know, these Hopi interpretations and to see more of the members members pottery that was actually reviewed in the project? Yeah. Is there so, where do we go to see that? Yeah, Dr. Ito has been working on it. And as I said, you know, he first transcribed all recorded materials that takes time. And then he's going to go through those text, you know, transcribe text with the Hopi reviewers. That also takes time. But then eventually he's going to put everything in the Minpaku, Minpaku's Info Forum Museum database. So people can access those very easily. And I just want to emphasize that though, he has been doing just a wonderful job because this is a primary, you know, recorded documents. So in other words, you know, anthropologists, archaeologists, we heavily relied on, we have been heavily relied on, you know, ethnographic documents, mm -hmm. which usually kept or recorded in the, you know, 19th and 20, early 20th centuries. But recording those voices and then, you know, keeping those narratives and stories into a database, then, you know, we can actually use those uh, for maybe our, you know, archaeological interpretations you know, in the future. And then think about it, after like two, three generations after Ben and I die, then, you know, our kids or the next generations and next generations, they're gonna listen to how those Hopi artists describe those materials, right? And then they can actually reconnect with their grandfather, you know, their uncles or, you know, aunt and yeah, they, 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 they kind of, you know, could be connected um in a very efficient way or much better way wow yeah no that's so important that's 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 a, that's really 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 important very good idea um yeah no, that just has so much potential for sure and for yeah. native people you know it's uh in in service to native yeah. people as well um yeah. so they can they can take advantage of those the, that's the, those materials um so um there was a question about some specifics of some of these design motifs that you uh, you were talking about. And this person asks, um, when you're saying that the Hopi artist connected the stair mo motif on members pottery with water or moisture, yeah. Yeah. Um, was that because Hopi connect that motif with such things when decorating their own pottery uh, now? Yeah, now. They okay. still use those motifs and designs for their contemporary art or art history. So that, that they could connect it very easily. Wow! Yeah. Um, yeah. There's that that connection is that is yeah. so neat to just to, to really bring that to the forefront. Um, and then so somebody asked, you know, um, you talked with Hopi people um, uh, specifically, and you know, you 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 um, say that they're descend descendant communities of the Mimbres people. Yeah. Um, do you think your interpretations or the results and then the interpretations from these folks would have been different if you talked to say Zuni collaborators or uh, folks yeah. from the Cris Pueblos? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, probably they're going to give us a different alternative voices or narratives. So that's why this kind of multivocal approach can work because we can also record them. And then, as I said, that even I, I'm not Hopi, I'm not Native American, I'm a Japanese, so I, I cannot say much about Native American perspectives. But one important thing I learned from this is that each clan members, he has a different perspective and brief as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like a bear clan and you know eagle clan, they have a different brief systems and perspectives. So it's the same thing. If we ask Zuni or other Akoma or other Pueblo groups or other, you know, Apache or, uh, you know, those groups, they're probably going to give us a different, but I think that's also they have, you know, their own interpretations and those are valid. And, you know, just we should kind of accept that 
you know, not like try to reject or try to oppose. Okay, one group said this and you didn't say this. So those are, you know, not valid, you know, points or argument. But I think we can kind of take a look at more bigger perspective. And then maybe at the end, we might be able to find some kind of core elements that maybe share, you know, by many different uh, tribal groups. If we can find some, that would be, you know, cool. But if we cannot find it, that's still, you know, it's valid and it's a wonderful information for us to know. Right. And there's other things you can you can argue with that, you know, that, yeah. that these things had multivocal meanings even yeah. when they were, you know, made contemporaneously. Um, no, that's really fascinating. And I think that's really, you know, one thing that really struck me about this this work, Fumi, was is just how, you know, you, you can't really just lock onto one one interpretation and say you know this is this and this is that yeah. um based on talking to one or two people you know you really need to look at this kind of bigger audience of of collaborators and and see the variety in those and so you know, i think that's really important for folks to think about in the broader discipline you know yeah. when we yeah. we try to often in archaeology as you know we try to push to kind of come up with like, okay, this is the answer. Yeah. Um, and, and that can, you know, potentially be dangerous, especially when you're yeah. trying to represent what a lot of different people are thinking. And um, especially just keep in mind though, you know, we are focusing on art and also landscape. You yeah. know, those are two abstract concepts. And as Ramson said, you know, we have probably more questions and then everybody maybe get the right answer, but it will, you know, be important for us to actually, you know, put those information, uh, narratives and everything together to create rich text. I think that that would be a better way to understand, you know, those art and landscape, I think. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's great. Um, well, let's see, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, let's see here. So, uh, can you foresee, you know, applying this type of, of research and your methods um, to other types of media? So say maybe Kiva murals or, you know, um, other types of things. Yeah. Do you think it yeah, would work yeah, that way? Definitely. So after this, you know, we just actually conducted another, um, not a workshop, but project with, you know, Octavius and you know, the Zuni elders. And what we did was, you know, there's a one cave located very close to, you know, from Las Cruces, it's called Chavez Cave. And the site was actually excavated by Kidder in 1920s. And that cave has been identified as a, identified as a ritual, you know, religious important site. So what I did or what, you know, Octavius and Zuni elders and I did was, we conducted two things together. One is visiting the site with them, you know, actually went to the site and see how the rock shelter or cave look like. And then after that, you know, they reviewed, you know, hundreds of perishables from the cave, which are created at the, you know, University Museum here. And that project was very interesting for me because probably I would say 80 or 90% of descriptions we did or museum personnel or archeologists did for those perishables. Yeah, the Zuni elders just collected them. I mean, they said those are not right term or, you know, this, this is what we still use them today. And, you know, yeah, the description of the catalog is not right. So we had to change everything actually. So that was a kind of interesting and, you know, yeah, it was a very, uh, interesting projects. And yeah, as I said, you know, this kind of research can be uh, used for many different things. And if you are interested in sandals, you can review those sandals with, you know, those uh, descendant groups or, you know, source communities, and then you can get, you know, more rich um, descriptions and interpretations, I think. Well, wow, I would, I know I would really love to do that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to be knocking on your door sometime soon, Fumi. Um, uh, not the least to come get some of that great New Mexican green chili. Um, <laughs> okay, well, um, let's see here. So actually, I think we pretty much have covered yeah, all of the, 
the questions. Uh, yeah. sorry, what? So I just want to say that though, so, you know, this collaborative work, I couldn't do it without Dr. Ito's contributions and he has been doing it. So I was kind of following his steps. And then also those five Hopi artists, you know, they are just amazing. And I, you know, I just cannot draw well or I cannot make any art. Like, as you know, you know, I cannot make any nice project points even and <laughs> cannot make a pottery. But those people have uh, eyes that they look at those designs very, you know, different ways and they know, you know, um, what they should look for. And, and it's, it's just an amazing, amazing uh, experience for me. So I just want to say thank you to those five Hopi artists. That's it. Great. Well, thank you again so much, um, Dr. Fumi Arakawa. Uh, this was a really great presentation, and I am long. really. Oh, it was no, it was the perfect minutes. length. <laughs> the perfect length. You couldn't have done any better. This was really, really good. So thank you so okay. much. All right. And okay. and remember, folks, you can um you can watch this again and again on YouTube or tune in to see some of our other uh, webinars. And we look forward to to seeing you soon, Fumi. Let's get together this summer. All right. Wait, what All, right. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good night.